So the next period that we're going to look at in the arms trade system is going to be the post-war period. Now, the boundaries and the environments of this post-war period temporally are going to roughly be between uh, 1946 and 1966. What Lawrence also finds is that arms trade is linked directly with bipolar and ideological systems. So remember that during this period is the rise between this really um, uh, uh, cleavaged uh, political world between the East and the West, between the Soviet Union and the U.S. And the arms trade patterns are going to mirror that differentiation. You're either going to import from states that support Russia or the states that support the U.S. Lawrence also finds that narrow oligopolistic arms supplier markets are not linked with dominant laissez-faire economic systems. What that essentially means is that although the world is seemingly still operating at least with commercial commodities in this laissez-faire type of economic system of free market trading, arms transfers are no longer applied to that. Arms transfers are now strictly controlled by the state. This is where you see the rise of states really beginning to use arms as tools of foreign, pol foreign policy and taking an active part on arms transfer decision making. So because of that, arms transfers don't mirror any type of trading pattern which is going on uh, just in the trade and regular commercial commodities at that point in time. Now arms are being very strictly controlled by the state. What Lawrence also finds is that during this period of time, although there's massive advances in military technology, it has little impact on the arms trade that's dominated primarily uh, by older surplus weapons systems. Remember that we're coming on the heels of World War II. The majority of your importing states during this period are going to be decolonized states, which probably don't have a whole lot of money to spend on arms. Well, the one really nice thing is that Russia and the U.S. were sitting on a huge stockpile of surplus arms from World War II that they could arm these other states with. So although you had the, you know, uh, the advent of the nuclear bomb, you had advances from propeller to jet technology, you aren't seeing too much um, arms trade within those goods. I mean, you aren't seeing any arms trade within nukes, but it, as far as more advanced military equipment, you aren't necessarily seeing a whole lot of arms trade having to do with those. The majority of the arms trade at this period of time is going to be transferred based on political alliances and is likely going to be comprised of older surplus weapons that both of these larger superpowers have remaining from World War II. Now, who does Lawrence say are the primary actors within this particular era of the arms trade system? Well, he says, first, the suppliers are going to be national governments. You are no longer going to see large or, uh, privatized corporate firms being the primary suppliers within the arms trade system. They have to now go through the national government because the governments want to keep strict control of arms trading because they're using the arms trade as a tool of foreign policy to build up their blocks and their allies throughout the world. What he also finds is that the ratio of exports to production is low. So there's going to be a low number of exports per production in the way that most states at this point in time, you have to remember that even the states who were involved in arms production prior to World War II, they don't necessarily have the capacity anymore because they've war torn and ra ravaged, right? And arms at this period of time with the advent of jet technology and things like that, those are becoming, that's becoming incredibly expensive. So they aren't really taking too much of a part in the arms trade system right now. Lawrence also finds that recipients are new states and potential clients of the two superpowers. So majority of states here, we have to remember that the world is also going through a process of decolonization. So the majority of Africa and the Middle East is now being relinquished of control um, by their old Euro European powers. So you have a lot of these incoming new states that now Russia and the U.S. are really trying to court and get them on their side. So the majority of the recipients during this period of time are going to be these more um, uh, developing states and not necessarily um, uh, uh, developed industrial power states, not quite yet. Uh, there are still multiple supplier relationships, but the multiple supplier relationships don't necessarily decrease your dependence at all. Because even those states that may be able to produce, like France, like Britain, even though they're still producing arms, 
they're producing and exporting arms basically under the same terms and conditions as the U.S. because they have politically and ideologically sided with the U.S. So although there are other arms suppliers besides the U.S. and Russia, they either have to align with uh, the foreign policies of the U.S. or Russia. Therefore, even though you may import from another state besides U.S. or Russia, you're kind of still importing from the U.S. or Russia, at least ideologically. So those the arms conditions, the arms transfer conditions are still tied to your political allegiances. So although there's multiple relationships, it doesn't decrease your dependence by that much. Um Acquisition rationales are not dependent on ideological and the political structure of the system. So the acquisition rationales, states that are importing arms, they aren't necessarily importing arms um, they, on ideological or political structures of the system. Now, the suppliers are, but the recipients aren't necessarily doing that. Remember, the, the majority of these uh, recipients are going to be developing nations. They don't necessarily care too much about who they ally with. They just want to be able to protect themselves. Now, when we look at the structure and stratification during this particular period, and this is going to be a relatively short slide to go over, because there's not much to say about the structure besides the fact that it's going to be incredibly bipolar. It's going to be between the U.S. and the USSR, and they dominate the market. Again, even though there are other states that are producing primary defense goods like planes, tanks, and ships, they have to be politically or ideologically aligned to one of the two nations, either the U.S. or the USSR. So even though there's other states taking part in arms transfers, it really doesn't matter a whole lot in the way that they're still aligned within this larger political bipolar system. So uh, the U.S. and Russia basically control the export of arms all throughout this entire era. If you are a state that is looking to import arms, you have to choose either between the U.S. or Russia, even though you might be importing from a state like Czechoslovakia or France, right? If you're importing from France, chances are you're going to have to believe in what the U.S. says. And if you're importing from Czechoslovakia, chances are you're going to have to believe in what the Russians say. So what are the modes of interaction during this time period? Well, Lawrence points out that the majority of the arms transfers during this period are going to be funded by grant aid. Grant aid is going to be the predominant mode of payment. Again, this also comes from the fact that both the U.S. and Russia have large stockpiles of arms uh, from World War II that they're ready and willing to give out uh, as aid to other nations that uh, support their cause. So grant aid is going to be the predominant mode of payment. The dominant modes of production are off-the-shelf uh, arms to third world nations, and then there's licensing within the blocks. So the majority of arms transfers that are going to go to developing nations are going to be surplus goods. It's going to be just off the shelf stuff. It's the tanks that you already have in the storage yard and things like that. Once you're operating within blocks, like let's say that, they're, that you're the U.S. or Britain and France wants to produce arms, you you allow licensing within the blocks. So um, you know, France can develop uh, 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 planes which look incredibly similar to the U.S. and Britain can and Western Germany can as well because they're developing it under licensing from the U.S. But licensing is really only occurring within those uh, more wealthy countries within a regional block. All right, so let's go over the regime norms and rules here. Now, as far as conflict goes, arms are going to be exported as a function of regional conflicts associated with the larger East-West rivalry. So yes, states are exporting to states in conflict, but essentially those states have to be participating in proxy wars um, for the ideological uh, uh, dom dominance of either the U.S. or Russia. And arms transfers are going to be a major instrument of national security policy. So both the U.S. and Russia look at this export of arms for um, the, these exports of arms under grant aid to states as kind of a tool of foreign pol policy and more importantly, a tool to guarantee the security of the U.S. within certain areas of the world or Russia within certain areas of the world. Now, as far as foreign policy and diplomacy goes, again, here, arms transfers are used primarily as a tool of foreign policy to signify and cement political alignment. If you're receiving arms from one of the two states, chances are what you're saying is that you believe in the political ideology of the state that you are importing from. And essentially, arms are being transferred from the U.S. and Russia as kind of this 
carrot method, right? So I want to incentivize you to come onto my site. So I can incentivize you by saying, hey, do you want the newest and best stuff? I can get you that. Or I can arm your mil- your uh, military to participate in a conflict within your region, right? So arms transfers are very much tied to the foreign policy of the suppliers. Arms are being transferred to coerce and influence the behavior of the recipient states. So keep that in mind because that also begins to change as we go uh, further and further uh, into the uh, 1900s. Economic effects, uh, arms transfers are still, again, primarily paid for by military aid. So you aren't seeing this kind of like laissez-faire, you have to have the cash. You're really getting the majority of these arms transfers funded um, by grant aid from the supplier states. Now, when we talk about arms trade control, we are seeing a decent amount of arms control going on. So national controls are rising. Right, states like the U.S. and Russia are strictly controlling the exports of arms out from their own states. So you are seeing that type of individual nationalistic control. You're also seeing a lot of unilateral control as well. So conflicts that may involve the two superpowers, if they get too hot, are seeing both nations kind of pull back on the arms transfers. The first Arab-Israeli conflict, you're seeing both the West and the and I should quit referring to it as the West and these. You saw both the U.S. and Russia stop arms transfers. They embargoed the conflict, stopped arms transfers to stop that conflict from going too hot. So you are seeing these types of arms control measures coming into play, but they're usually at the national level or at the unilateral level. You aren't seeing a whole lot of multinational or sorry, multilateral or international control going on during this time period. And that's going to change.